you. Thank you. Um, wow, well, it's a real honour to speak at Greenbelt. It's an honour to be asked. And um, thank you very much for the warm welcome. So this talk has been billed as um, come and learn about the inspiring story of the Stansted 15, but actually I think the much more interesting story is um, the stories of the people who were meant to be on the plane that night. And I'll come onto that a bit more later on. So uh, a little bit about, about me, um, since most of you will just know that I was uh, part of the Stansted 15 group. Um, I, um, I describe myself as a community activist. I've uh, mainly been doing activism around climate change issues for the last 13 years. And in 2016, I was um, finishing off my community service for um, a big climate change action uh, that I'd done around um, well, against uh, the third runway at Heathrow. And after I finished my community service for, for that action, I started volunteering at my local migrant centre. And it was there that I learnt about the, uh, you know, the huge amount of suffering that was happening in, in my community. Um, happening to, to migrants and mainly women and children. And it really brought home to me like the effect of the hostile environment. Um, Obviously, I heard in the news about you know, what was happening to people in the Mediterranean Sea and what was going on in Calais, but I was too busy with other things that I was doing to um, you know, actually give it deep thought. And when I started volunteering in the Migrant Centre, I, I realised that, wow, this is something that's not happening sort of far away. This is uh, happening to people in my communities as well. So I've been volunteering there for a few months and um, saw people in my community being absolutely shafted um, and uh, that the Home Office were making really bad decisions, right, refusing people's claims without any good reason. And then some of my friends from um, Plain Stupid, the group, the Environmental Direct Action Group I'd been organising with at the time, um, approached me about wanting to do an action to stop a deportation. And so... We had a number of conversations uh, about this, and eventually we settled on this idea that we would stop um, the deportation at the airport, and we would do so by staging an occupation like by the deportation plane. So we decided to, to target um, a, a charter flight, a mass deportation flight, because we realized that Mass deportation flights are really the most brutal aspect of the, of the hostile environment. Um, these charter, charter flights take place on a regular basis. Um, they happen in a remote part of, of the airport, away from the public view. Um, they happen in the middle of the night. It's very secretive. Um, and report after report, um, has concluded that there's a lot of abuse that takes place on these flights, but physical abuse, um, racist abuse. People are forced onto, onto planes. They're, they can be shackled. Um, this includes women. This includes people with disabilities. And so for us, that's the most, the most brutal aspect of, of um, the hostile environment. A few days before we took our action, we also heard about some of the stories of the people who were on that flight, um, or who were due to be on the flight that night. And um, in particular, one story we were really touched by was um, the story of a Nigerian woman who uh, is a lesbian, and she's been in this country for many years, and she'd escaped her abusive uh, ex-husband. She, she was in a forced marriage in Nigeria. And she wrote about how she was in fear of her life, both because her abusive ex-husband had threatened to kill her when she returns, and also because, as, as she puts it, being lesbian is not okay in Nigeria. So Nigeria has some of the most uh, repressive laws for LGBTQ uh, people in the world, 
and um, people can be thrown into prison for many years just because of who they love. Uh, and also mob violence is, is uh, very common against LGBTQ people. So we knew about some of the stories of the people that were meant to be on, on the flight that, um, that we stopped. It was, it was going to Nigeria and Ghana. And we took our action um, successfully on the 28th of March, 2017. And we, we, we cut a hole in, in, in the fence. We walked over to the plane. Um, we erected um, a tripod. Uh, and we had a banner that said, no one is illegal. And we lay on the tarmac until the police cut us out. So as a result, that, that, that flight didn't leave that night. We were very happy that we'd succeeded in, in, in the action. You know, our, 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 our hope was that in doing that action, we would give uh, a window of opportunity for the people who were meant who were meant to be deported that night to get um, get a decent lawyer and lodge lodge an appeal. So we knew that 50% of people are successful in their immigration appeals, and that you know literally a difference of, of minutes can um, you know can can make all the difference to to some people. So. Yeah, the, it, it, we were euphoric after we did the action and that we, you know, that we managed to pull it off. Um, the action took place the day before Article 50 was, was invoked. So we, we thought that we weren't going to get any media coverage whatsoever, that um, you know, the reason for doing the action was you know, purely to give like, additional time to, um, to the people on the flight. And we were also working with other people who who were liaising with people in detention and really pushing for people to sign up to the legal appointments in detention so that they would have the best possible chance of um, being successful in their appeals. So initially we were charged with aggravated trespass, which is what we expected to be charged with. However, um, fast forward to, uh, to the end of the last year, 10th of December, it's International Human Rights Day. And we'd just been convicted of uh, endangering uh, the safety of an aerodrome. So this is terrorist-related legislation. And we've just been convicted on International Human Rights Day. So this was a blow. <laughs> um, it's reasonable. So, so we were convicted under, like, specifically, Section 1 of the Aviation, Maritime and Security Act, 1990. Um, and the maximum penalty for, for that offence is life in prison. So the maximum penalty of aggravated trespass is three months in prison. The maximum penalty of what we got, eventually got convicted of was um, life in prison. Now, the, the sentence of life gives an indication of what the legislation was intended for. So it wasn't intended for uh, campaigners campaigning against uh, climate change or um, campaigners against forced deportations. Um, this, this particular um, piece of legislation is about implementing the Montreal Protocol which is an international treaty about suppressing acts of unlawful violence at airports. So it's to deal with um, like the Lockerbie bombing, that, that kind of situation. And never before has this legislation been used against peaceful activists. In fact, it's only ever been used once before in, you know, since 1990 when it was passed. Now, I mean, the, the case just, just blew up, as, as, as you know, like it, it attracted a lot of media, media attention in the end. Um, the Crown Prosecution Service consistently denied that we had been charged with counter-terrorism legislation. Uh, they pointed to the fact that the judge in our case had ruled that um, the legislation was capable of very wide interpretation, 
and the judge didn't seem concerned with um, indications to the contrary by um, the UN that expressed very deep concern about our case um, by the uh, debates that were happening in Parliament as recorded in, in Hansard at the time that the legislation was going through Parliament. Um, all about the wording of the Act itself. Um, and the CPS has good reason to, uh, to deny that, that, you know, that that's what happened, that we, that we were convicted of counter-terror legislation. Because clearly, charging peaceful activists and convicting peaceful activists with um, counter-terror legislation uh, breaches Article 11 of the Human Rights Act. So this is the right to peaceful assembly and the right to protest. It was a breach of um, you know, uh, Article 11 to, to charge us in the first place, but during the trial itself, and our trial lasted two and a half months, the judge had to interpret every term that defined the offence um, in, in the lowest possible way, you know, in, in the lowest possible threshold. So in combination, the use of, of this offence the, very, the court's very broad interpretation of it and the low thresholds you know, a actually creates a very um, wide and, and new offence. And as our lawyers argued in, in court, um, if you stage a picket, if, if workers stage a picket, uh, say, to, to get higher wages, um, and a picket would, would be unauthorised, um, then if they had um, a device with them, um, the judge interpreted device to mean any object, so if they had a lock or a wheelchair, for example, or, or banners and signs, then, then those people would be guilty under this counter-terrorism legislation as well because it, it's that broad. And actually one of the few um, areas of risk that the prosecution could point to in our case during the trial was in fact that there was a diversion of police resources to deal with our protest, which, which of course would be the same for any protest. So um, to turn now to, to, to the facts of, of what, what happened in, in our case, or what, what happened on the night that we did the action, 15 of us, dressed in high visibility vests, wearing jumpers that said mass deportations kill and no one is illegal, cut a hole in the perimeter fence in a remote part of Stansted Airport. We um, walked calmly to where the plane was, which was 100 meters away from the fence, carrying um, scaffolding poles to erect the tripod and our banners and our metal tubes that, that, um, you know, that we used to lock onto each other. We got to the plane, we set up our tripod, we hung a banner that said, no one is illegal. Myself and, and three others uh, locked on around the nose wheel of the plane. And we just lay on the tarmac. We lay on the tarmac for between eight to 10 hours, like basically until the, the police cut each of us out. And we did this to, um, you know, to stop that deportation flight um, because we were deeply concerned about the, um, the risks to people's lives if they were forcibly deported. No one was hurt in our action. The only damage was the damage to the fence which the airport estimated to cost 300 pounds. And we stopped, we stopped the flight. Where, where we were was about 600 meters away from, from the runway. So it's a fair distance from the runway and there's a barrier. Um, essentially like the, the plane was in a, the, you know, the equivalent of a, like the, the plane parking space, like the equivalent of a, of a car parking space. Um, part of the airport. So, 11 people remain in the country. 
many more um, might might do so as well. Men, Eleven of the si of the sixty people that were meant to be deported that night, many more might do so had the Home Office not taken steps to deport as many people as possible the next day. And some of these people would not have ever had access to to lawyers. So. Turning to the, um, you know, to what the prosecution argued in during our trial, um, the prosecution couldn't point to any um, to any harm that actually happened because 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 no harm did happen. Um, they had to rely on theoretical risks, and um, these included, as, as I mentioned earlier, the diversion of police resources. So the uh, the prosecution argued that police had to, um, you know, leave their ordinary duties and come and deal with our protest. And they said this uh, this reduced the capacity of the police to be able to, to cope with a terrorist incident. Had a terrorist incident coincidentally occurred at the same time as our action, so the uh, prosecution didn't disclose how many um, police were were in fact diverted. And um, we note that the passenger terminal was never at any time like shut to the public. I mean, one would think if, if there was a, a risk um, in not being able to deal with the terrorist incident, then you know, if that was a real concern, they would have shut the passenger terminal. But as it was, they didn't shut it. And there was never any suggestion within the airport that they would shut the, uh, the terminal. Another area of risk that was identified by the prosecution was um, a police officer during a 10 second chase of one of, one of my co-defendants who didn't manage to lock on, slipped and nearly fell over. <laughs> so if you get chased by a cop <laughs> on a demo and it's near an airport, then you can be charged and convicted under counter-terrorism legislation if a cop nearly falls. Um, another area of, of risk was the fact that the, um, well, the, the pilot gave evidence and said that he felt fear when he saw us because for a moment he didn't know whether our group had been infiltrated by nefarious others. And the, the, the final area of risk that was identified by the prosecution was that because what we did that night wasn't authorised by the airport safety manuals, um, it follows that what we did was, was, was unsafe. So, you know, really this, this amounts to a health and safety violation. Um, it's... We, we have been convicted under a very broad, like completely new offence that was invest that was invented by uh, by the, the the prosecution in our case and by um, by the judge, um, and it's to restrict protest. Clearly, <laughs> in in my view, charging and convicting peaceful activists with uh, counter-terror legislation is repressive. Inventing new offences by sophistry is um, an abusive process and denying that you did so. The CPS have repeatedly denied that we would, that um, this legislation is counter-terror legislation. Denying it is a cover-up. So, in terms of where that leaves us defendants, you know, we, we've lodged an appeal and we've just heard this week um, that we've got permission to appeal. So we've, we've cleared the first legal hurdle towards clearing our names. Thank you. Um, but it's, it's going to be a long process, so we don't know exactly when the appeal is. It is the, the substantive appeal is going to be heard, but we expect it to be um, towards um, the very end of this year, or um, probably more likely um, early next year. Um, the action was the, the the best thing I've ever done in my life, despite the huge. Uh, 
consequences um, for my life and you know, all of our lives, like the effect on, on my health, um, you know, my job prospects, my, my ability to, to, to plan my future. Um, it's been very tough, but, um, but, but look at what we've achieved um, or what the action achieved. 11 people are still here, they're still in the country that would have been deported that night. <laughs> it's definitely a cause to clap. Um, so that includes men and women. Um, it includes parents of dependent children. Um, it includes trafficking survivors. Um, one of the people, I mean, I, I've met a number of, of people from the flight um, and one of them is uh, a dad who's about my age, and um, at the time of his attempted unlawful deportation, um, he had two. Yeah, he had two small children, and um, his partner was pregnant with his third child. And had he been deported, had he been deported that night, the first time that he would have seen his newborn child would have been over Skype. So, I personally can't imagine what, what that feels like. The guy, the guy has been in the country, in this country, longer than, you know, he, he'd been in Nigeria. And, uh, you know, he had a family here. I can't imagine what it must be like to be ripped away from, from your family and, and your community. Um, and any time I, I start to, 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 you know, sort of feel a bit down about, about some of the consequences that have flowed from uh, me doing this action, you know, I just think about the fact that, um, that this person, or, you know, we kept a family together. This person is, is able to, um, you know, be a dad to his children, like his children have their dad. Um, he's able to continue um, providing for his family economically. Um, you know, it's not just the 11 people who got to stay, it's, it's their families too, it's their friends, it's their loved ones. Um, I mean, I, mean um, uh, I write to uh, another person who was on that flight who's a trafficking survivor. And she, after you know, many, many years, like long battles with the Home Office, she's you know, got her status now, and, and she is now rebuilding her life here. Um, her story is extremely sad. Um, I won't go into it, but to have experienced such suffering and to um, you know, go through that process with, with the Home Office, it's incredibly re-traumatizing. And knowing that that person now has, um, you know, is now able to, like, move on with their lives in this country, I, I think is, is just fantastic and, and just, you know, also reminds me, like, definitely what we did is, is so worthwhile. Um, and I know some of the others um, from the plane have, have gone on to be politically active. They're supporting other migrants in their community, um, you know, who are fighting the, uh, the Home Office and, you know, well, fighting for the right to stay here. Um, so, you know, there's, there's the people um, who remain in the country. Um, we, we shone a light on the, uh, the charter flights process and how brutal it is um, at a time when there wasn't a huge amount of awareness about what's going on. So when we did the action originally, this, this was before the Windrush scandal broke. Um, but since the action, there's been, you know, there's, you know, so many other groups are doing great things and um, the Windrush campaign has, you know, ha has been successful um, to a degree. There's a huge amount more to be done, but um, you know, they've, they've been uh, very successful at, at communicating the, the, the injustice of um, the immigration system. Um, yeah, we've gal galvanized uh, lots of um, different groups and we've built alliances as well, in particular, um, the Christian community in Chelmsford. So our court case took place in Chelmsford and we were extremely lucky to be hosted by um, 
members of the Christian community in Chelmsford, and we had the support of the bishop um, and many other community leaders, which uh, was amazing. Um, Labour Party... Um, Labour Party policy has, has changed, so you know that's, that's really good news. Um, Labour have committed to um, ending the practice of charter flights, which is fantastic. Um, they've committed to um, putting a time limit on detention of 28 days, which is hugely significant because at the moment people, when they get put into detention, um, they're held in detention on on administrative grounds, not on criminal grounds. So that means there's no judicial oversight of that system, like some bureaucrat is making a decision about whether you stay in detention or not. And um, we're one of the few uh, countries that allows for indefinite detention. So detention centers are, are basically like prisons, um, except they're, they're even worse because you never know when, you, when you're going to get out. So some people have been in detention for years and they still don't know when they're going to get out. And that in itself is a form of torture. Um, so, yes, in terms of Labour Party policy, they've also, they've also committed to shutting down um, some of the most notorious detention centres, inclu including um, Yarlswood Women's Detention Centre and Brook House. So that, that is a very good start. Um, in terms of what hasn't been achieved yet is um, like a change to, to the actual policy and on the ground. So people continue to be deported in, you know, by charter flight in, you know, this, this incredibly secretive and um, brutal way. And despite report after report after report um, criticizing the uh, you know, how bad home office decision making is, like the risks that people face when they're forcibly deported. Um, you know, there, there really hasn't been like anything in, in terms of anything significant in terms of policy change. So, so that's massive and that, and that shows that we've got uh, this huge more amount of campaigning to be done. Um, I'm... You know, I'm, I'm, I think I mentioned at the start that I, I'm, you know, think of myself as a climate change campaigner. And, um, and I'm also particularly concerned about this issue um, from the point of view of, like, climate justice and migrant um, justice are, are, are closely related. So the places that people are being deported back to are, um, like, former British colonies that... Uh, that are facing the brunt of, of, of climate change. So it's countries like Nigeria, Ghana, Pakistan, Jamaica. Um, I mean, when, when people talk about climate change, they, they talk about you know, the UN reports and you know, stuff happening in, in 10 to 12 years. But actually, for many people in the global south, catastrophe is not, is not imminent. It's not something that's, you know, happening in some years down the line. It's, it's happening now. Um, so people are going to continue to move because they don't have viable lives where they are. And, you know, we really need a, a completely new uh, approach to this. The, 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 the way that the migrant crisis is portrayed in the media is, um, you know, deeply wrong and very, um, very narrow. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of activism coming up. There's lots, of, there's lots of events, there's lots of demonstrations that are being planned. Um, there's a climate strike on the uh, 20th of September, Extinction Rebellion doing stuff from October. And I think it's really important um, to get involved in, in, in those actions because, you know, it's... It will, the most important issue of our time. Um, but also I think it's very important to um, weave into you know, the narrative about climate justice, migrant solidarity, and the fact that um, the people from the global south are the people who are bearing the brunt of, of climate change right now. And we, you know, we, we need to work in, in, in solidarity with them if we want a just, peaceful and sustainable future. Oh, 
I think that was all I was going to say. So thank, thank you very much. And I think we've got time for a few questions, if there are any. <laughs> <laughs>